All right, we are going to be in the fifth chapter of 1 Corinthians. So we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We looked at the first topic last week, um, the last two weeks in 1 Corinthians 2 through 4, and that was Paul dealing with the discussion of divisions, how do we escape divisions and divisiveness in our own local church and assembly. And this week we are talking about cleaning out immorality. And I think the key to this section is to understand that primarily the danger that Paul is not talking about is the danger of sin and immorality, but it is the danger of celebrating sin. As I said before, 1 Corinthians is topical, so Paul is just simply going from topic to topic. The issues that the Corinthian church are going on, that have going on, that they are presenting to Paul. So first they came to Paul saying, we got divisions in our church, we got at least four cliques in our church, and Paul is calling on them to get rid of their prideful divisions and put on humility. Uh, now we are called on to clean out immorality through discipline. And there's more than a few issues in our churches and our society that are relevant to what we see today. So let's look first at the problem of immorality in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So we see the issue in verses 1 and 2. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that the one who has done this deed would be removed from your midst. So Paul comes right out and says, you guys have a problem with poor Nia. Uh, pornea, which is the word that's translated into immorality in our English Bibles. Uh, this is the word that we get the English word pornography from. And pornea, from a Roman perspective at that time period, was actually not seen as a bad thing. Uh, it was just something you did in life. From the Jewish perspective, pornea was any sexual behavior outside of a marriage between a husband and wife. So adultery, prostitution, any form of sexual abuse, lust in your heart, homosexuality, it was all counted as pornea. And the pornea that Paul writes of that is being proclaimed in Corinth at this time period is incest, a man living with his father's wife. Now, in my view, the big problem in 1 Corinthians 5 is not the presence of immorality or pornea in the church, because let's be frank, if a church is winning people to Jesus Christ, if you're bringing in new believers, you are going to have some problems with some sexual sins. Even Christians who have been in the church for decades fall back into this sin. The problem wasn't so much that this sin occurred. The problem that Paul is dealing with is the church's response to the sin. What gets Paul upset is that when the church should have mourned over their sin, instead, they celebrated the sin. So they should have mourned over the sin. They should have called their brother to repentance. They should have walked by his side to help him walk in holiness. Instead, they were coming to him and saying, you, you go in your freedom. You be you. We're going to rejoice that you're going to live in this way. Hey, we have more freedom in our church than they have outside of it in the city of Corinth. Now, what we need to understand is that while this passage is a little shocking to us because we see incest and we still think, ew, it's really not all that removed from a lot of behavior in churches in America today. Because we need to remember, as I said, in Paul's world, pornea was not considered to be a bad thing, especially in the city of Corinth. Remember, as I mentioned in our introduction to this book, that uh, people would travel around the world to go to Corinth for the specific reason of sleeping with the temple prostitutes in the city. Homosexuality at this time period was celebrated by the Romans because it wasn't considered cheating on your spouse if you did so with someone of the same gender. So too in America. We are also arrogant over our sexual sins. And I went on to Google this week and I searched church pride parade online and I found church after church after church that was promoting pride parades. 
So to find a church that is arrogant over sexual sins in their community because they're commonplace in the community is no shock. And I believe that this celebrating is what Paul has so upset. Because the one thing that we need to realize looking at the book of Corinth and other New Testament letters is that sin will come into our lives. We will all stumble and fall in various areas. The question for the believer is, how do we respond to these sins and the failings? And Paul says that when sin enters our lives, we are to respond with judgment and power. Look at verses 3 through 5. For I, on my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this, as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you assembled and I was with you, and I with you in spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus. I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Paul speaks of doing two things in these three verses. The first Paul speaks of is passing judgment upon the sin. Paul's basically saying, I don't even need to be raw. I didn't even need to be present in the church to be able to tell you that what's going on there is wrong. So our first action when sinful behavior enters the church is to cast judgment upon that sin. And I think the basic way we in the church cast judgment upon sin is to label sin, sin. To say that that is a sinful action that is wrong before God. Now I believe based upon what Jesus teaches us in Matthew chapter 18... Uh, when Jesus talks about discipline in the church in that chapter, and that is if we hear about someone in sin or their sin enters into our lives as in they sin against us, the first step is we go to them privately. We go to them individually and we boldly speak God's judgment against their sinful practices, whether it be in sex or greed or divisions or hatred. We declare to them, What you are doing is sin in the eyes of God. And God desires you to walk away from that sin. And I believe it becomes a church issue once arrogance enters the picture. Once the the sinner becomes arrogant to look at the person who confronted them and saying, yeah, 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 that that might be sin in the Bible. But I'm telling you, I'm going to speak my truth. And I'm going to declare my way, and I'm going to tell you that this sin is good, and I want to be loved how I want to be loved, and I want to love how I want to love. So I'm going to declare that this is good. And it becomes worse when more people in the church join in together with the sinner. They begin to back up his behavior of iniquity and say that it is good. And at that time period, the entire church, which is what Paul's calling for here, needs to step up in power and deliver a message of judgment and discipline. And Paul says the discipline that he has in mind in this chapter, and it is discipline that when you read it, you're just like, is that really what you want to say here, Paul? You really want to go that far? Because Paul says his discipline is deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. This sounds super harsh. Does Paul really mean this? And what does it even mean that he says deliver someone over to Satan? And first I want to point out that, that yeah, Paul means this because this is not the only time in the New Testament Paul uses this discipline. It also comes up in 1 Timothy 1.20. Among these are Hermione and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they will be taught not to blaspheme. Just want to explain a little bit what I, I think this means. Again, Paul does not explain specifically what this means, so we need to, you know, use what we know about Satan and the result of what will end up happening in 2 Corinthians to try to understand what happens here. Uh, The name Satan actually means the accuser. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He's the person who stands up before God and says, they are guilty. 
And so I think that what Paul is trying to do here is he's saying, we want to deliver this person over into the realm of Satan, into the fullness of their sin, so they will experience the consequence of their sin and be able to know, I am guilty. We want the accusations of Satan as the accuser and the adversary to stick upon them. And the only way for that to happen is that we need to remove someone from the protections of the church so they may feel the pain of their sin and then desire to repent of the sin in which we are speaking. Uh, We've been talking on Wednesdays about the importance of building boundaries in our lives. Boundaries basically means I'm going to be responsible for what I'm responsible for, and you're going to be responsible for what you're responsible for. And a major part of what we've learned in boundaries is allowing other people, when they walk into sin in their lives, to experience and feel the consequences of their sinful behavior. And I think that this is what Paul is saying here. We want to take away the protections of the church from this man. We want to declare that what he is doing is sinful, allow Satan to make his accusations upon him, so then that man will discover, yes, this is sinful behavior. In a way, we want to live out the story of the prodigal son. When did the prodigal son end up realizing that he had sinned against his father by taking his inheritance early and spending it on wanton and sinful living? It was when he ended up stuck in the pigsty and eating the pig filth. That's when he realized, I think my dad was right all along and this is not what I should be doing. And so handing someone over to Satan, we're saying, I want them to experience the consequences of their sin so that they can feel the accusation that what they're doing is wrong. We don't want to continue to protect someone and shelter them when they're in the midst of their sinful behavior because that's a way of just saying, what you're doing is okay. I'm going to continue to help you in the midst of it. We want them to feel the pain and the difficulty of their sin. And the goal of this is not... We want them to burn forever and never be a part of the church. Our goal is so what Paul says, his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. I don't take this as speaking of eternal eternal salvation, but I take this as rescuing someone from the consequences of sin in their life so that when Jesus returns, so that on the day that Jesus comes and takes the church to his own, that day that they die and then they stand before Jesus for the first time, that when they stand before Jesus, in spite of that time they had in their sin, that they will be restored so then Jesus can look at them and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You see, what we believe when we hand someone over to Satan who has fallen into sin is that a week of failure is a gross sin. So is a month of sin or a year of sin or even a decade of sin. But our hope is is that even after a week or a month or a year or a decade, that they'll feel the consequence of their sin. They'll come back to the church. We will be, have our arms around them immediately to help restore them so that they can then walk in faithfulness for the rest of their lives on this earth. If someone loses their 40s to gross sin and immorality... Why can they not be restored at the age of 51 and then have 30 wonderful years of walking in faith and fellowship with God? We're always looking to restore that person uh, to build up their spirit who has fallen into sin. But we need to let that work be done on the consequences of their sin so they see the importance of repentance and returning To God. And that's what we're actually going to end up seeing when we look at 2 Corinthians, that that's what happened after they handed him over to Satan. Our next concern when it comes to sexual sins, or really any sin, is not only the uh, sinner realizing that what they've done wrong and then having their spirit restored, but also protecting the entire church when these sin issues occur. And we see that in verses 6 through 8. Your boasting, see again, this is what Paul's concern is. It's the celebration, the boasting. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also 
has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So again, Paul's concern here is what happens if we allow sin to fester in the body? We begin to uh, accept and allow and rejoice over the sin of one person. Paul says that that sin will end up acting like leaven in a loaf of dough. And that is that leaven or that sin will spread across the rest of the church. And we do not want that sin to spread across the church. So we will practice justice, judgment, and discipline so that that sin will not be tolerated and spread. Because we can see how easy it is in our own culture when you celebrate one person or one group sin, it becomes easier and easier for people to say, oh, I guess that behavior is not a big deal. I'll do the same And then that next person usually falls a little bit deeper into sin, and then sin acts like leaven. Once it's welcomed into the dough, it spreads everywhere throughout the dough. An example of that, just look at the sin of homosexuality in America today. In 2009, only 37% of Americans favored gay marriage and 54% opposed it. But then in 2015... Gay marriage was legalized by the Supreme Court. It was made the law of the land. The White House celebrated it with rainbow colors on the White House. And the change in America over the last six years, and it's crazy, it's only been six years. Uh, It's shocking. Today, 70% of Americans favor gay marriage. And what has come from that, to me, has been even more shocking as we have fallen faster into the descent of pornea and immorality than probably any culture since ancient Rome and the Corinthians. I mean, and this, to me, the shocking thing is that the biggest issue right now when it comes to sexual um, practices in America, where the big battlefield is over children. It's over little kids and sex. Right now, I can't watch, let my kids watch Nickelodeon. Because on Nickelodeon, you have men proclaiming multiple different forms of sexual sin as a prideful activity. And then a few weeks ago, Disney or Pixar released a film called Luca. And initially, I wasn't going to watch it with my kids because I assumed there must be some messaging in there because it's it's everywhere these days. And uh, then I heard a few things about the movie and I decided, you know what, me and my kids, we are going to watch it. And we watched Luca and it was It was really a delightful little film. It was a great movie about three friends, and the two boys are actually sea monsters, and it's just this cute little thing, and they're they're in this race, and they want to earn money because they want to have a Vespa, Uh, and it's just it's just a cute little movie about childhood friendship, and because it was a cute little movie about childhood friendship, the progressive community in America was furious. The response to Luca have been, how dare you have a movie with two young boys and not end up having them be sexually attracted to one another? People wrote that Disney had missed their chance of making a movie for the LGBTQ community. A com- another common theme was, I'm going to interpret this movie as being queer, no matter what the writers claim it is about. So in six years, we've gone from let's legalize gay marriage to now we're at the point where someone just wants to make a simple, cute little movie about three childhood friends, and it is how dare you not have them be gay. And then this week, the San Francisco Gay Choir released a music video. I don't know if any of you have seen this in the news, but the San Francisco Gay Choir put out a music video where they sang, we are coming for your kids. We are coming to indoctrinate your children. Paul says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. We went from legalizing private behavior between two consenting adults with gay marriage, and we find that that sin is coming everywhere in our society, and right now it is coming the most after our children. 
And this shows why we need to bring power and judgment upon sin. And again, the major issue is when the sin is arrogant in the church. We cannot allow these sins to be proclaimed in our churches. The people who will end up paying for the sins that we proclaim today are our children and teens and young adults for tomorrow. Uh, because what we just simply allow and tolerate, they will end up celebrating this. And so I don't think I can emphasize this enough, but the problem in 1 Corinthians 5 is when we go from being shamed over sin to rejoicing over sin. One thing we always, always need to make clear in the church is that we will be unbelievably compassionate to any person who struggles with any sin be it homosexuality or drunkenness or, or envy that breaks out in compulsive spending. We, we love the sinner. We want to care for them and cherish them and be by their side and help them to walk in grace and truth. The problem that Paul is dealing with here is not the struggle with sin, the battle with sin. What Paul is dealing with is the issue when people begin to boast and rejoice over sin. Because it is the celebration of sin that leads to the spread of sin. And next, in verses 9 through 11, Paul's going to talk about how we are to handle sins different between believers and unbelievers. Paul says, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of the world, or with the covetous and the swindlers, or with the idolaters. For then you would have to go out of the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any brother, you can cross off that so-called, any brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. What Paul is doing in these verses is he's making a clear line of separation between how we treat the world when it rejoices over sin and the way we treat our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ when they rejoice over sin. When the world rejoices over sin, we do not separate from them, we do not judge them, we do not stand apart from them, because if this was so, who could we witness to and where could we even live? You see this in the pattern of Jesus' ministry. When Jesus was spending time with his 12 disciples, with the inner three, with people who were coming to him and saying, Jesus, I want to follow you. Jesus' demands upon them were, woo, they were super high and hard. You know, take up your cross and follow me. If you don't hate your father and mother, you don't love me. The demands that Jesus placed upon his followers were impossibly hard, reminding us that if we want to walk following Jesus in fellowship and discipleship, it is incredibly difficult. But when Jesus went and spoke with the woman at the well, he did not say to her, hey, uh, if you're going to want to sit next to me, I first need you to take up your cross and follow me. I need you to give up everything that you have in your life. And, and, then, and then we can sit together. No, Jesus first came to her and offered her living water before he called upon anything else in her life. Same thing with Nicodemus, the teacher of the law. Jesus didn't go up to him and, and you know, bear down on him for how idiotic he was with all of his terrible interpretations of the law, but Jesus began to immediately speak to him about the new birth. And in the same way, when we speak to the world uh, in the midst of their immorality and their sin, our message must be the free gift of eternal life. It must be belief in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. We must follow Jesus' pattern uh, in John when they were about to stone the adulterous woman and Jesus did not start off by saying, you know, if you want my protection, I need you to commit that you confess that you will never commit these sins again. But Jesus begins the forgiveness and then he says, go and sin no more. So we always want to deliver forgiveness compassion and grace first. We want to be willing to offer God's love 
And we don't pass the judgment and the power upon sin until someone is in the midst of our church and in the midst of our fellowship. And so Paul writes here about multiple sins, the immoral person, the covetous, the idolater, the reviler, the drunkard, the swindler. And I don't think he's making a a standard list of sins here, but I think he's just saying anybody in the world who is in any of the sins, uh, you are to welcome them in forgiveness. But if somebody in the church is living in those same sins, you need to live in judgment and discipline against them. And then remember always this idea of not even eating with such a one. Our goal in this discipline is not to keep someone in that separated state, but our goal is we want them to see the pain and the consequences of their sin, and as soon as they will repent of their sin, we will restore them and welcome them back into the fellowship. So we want to make sure that when we treat the world one way in their sins, it's different than the way that we treat uh, the church and our fellow brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. So um, if the um, American Legion Hall, if they wanted to do something with having our church come in and, you know, do something to partner with them for the community, uh, I, would, I would partner with the American Legion in a second because they're not a Christian organization. So even if they have other groups in their building and in their facilities where there are gay marriages going on, people getting drunk on the weekends, I'll, I'll go into that mix. To, to work and help and give the grace of Christ with them. But on the other hand, if almost right across the road, if Little Farms United Church of Christ, which is open and affirming of sexual sins, if they wanted to do something with us to partner, I'd be like, sorry, uh, we cannot be on the same side because we differ um, over our response to sin and you say you're in the church and we're not. So we need to have different standards of where we will be in unison with those in the church and where we will pass judgment upon them. And then he's going to end this chapter in verses 12 and 13 by basically doubling down on the importance of judging those in the church and not judging those who are outsiders. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? And the answer is, it's not our role. Do you not judge those who are within the church? Yes. But those who are outside, God judges. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. So Paul's just doubling down here saying, whenever we talk about this judgment and this power upon sin, it's about those who are in our fellowship, those who are in our body. And one of the hard things about, I think, about practicing this judgment and discipline in the American church today is that it's really easy if someone begins to pass judgment upon them for them to just say, oh, well, I'm just going to go to this other church on the other side of town because they're not going to pass judgment upon me. Um, As I found in my pastoral ministry that every time I've started the conversation about uh, someone being in sin and discipline, they're, they're gone. And uh, I don't see them anymore, but that's, I guess, what the discipline's supposed to do anyway. Um, So let us respond to the sins in our midst with mourning and with discipline. And when we reach out to the community, let us do so with grace and with mercy.